Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And welcome to part 3 of our Skyrim Mysteries Iceberg. By now, you all probably know the drill about these things, so I won't bore you with too much preamble. But, I think by virtue of being our final episode, this will be our best one yet. Part 3 consists of the remainder of Tier 4, as we didn't manage to finish it in our last episode, and all of Tier 5. These are the absolute most juicy mysteries yet, the cream of the crop, the most under-discussed and abundantly fascinating stuff we've tackled so far. Thus, without any further ado, let's do further. Well, maybe just a little further ado. Because speaking of mysteries, you never know what you're gonna bump into on the internet. From geoblockers to hackers to unwelcome trackers, cyberspace is littered with threats to your convenience, and more importantly, to your privacy. That's why today's video is being sponsored by NordVPN, the gold standard of virtual private networks. I've personally been using NordVPN for over four years. It offers a layer of encryption that protects your data when on vulnerable Wi-Fi networks, which is to say most Wi-Fi networks, and by allowing you to change your IP connection to any one of 59 countries, you'll be able to consume content that otherwise might be blocked in the region you're at. I recently took a trip to Germany, and NordVPN gave me peace of mind while browsing shady airport Wi-Fi, and allowed me to access a certain otherwise blocked streaming service while at my hotel. And if you head over to nordvpn.com slash epicnate, you can try it out risk-free with a 30-day money-back guarantee, and four months entirely free with a two-year plan. That's nordvpn.com slash epicnate. Now, back to our regularly scheduled programming. Starting off Tier 4, or what really is number 7 or 8 of Tier 4, because, you know, we didn't finish this one last video. Where does Rune come from? So, Rune, for those of you who aren't familiar, is an Imperial member of the Thieves' Guild, who spends his days meandering around the Cistern and socializing at the Ragged Flagon. He's a rather generic character, who plays no significant role in any of the faction's quests, and at face value, seems to be more of a filler character than anything. You know, just one of those NPCs Bethesda created and gave a couple radiant lines of dialogue to, to make the place feel more alive without much effort. That is, until we do a little digging. You see, while he tends to keep to himself and doesn't offer much in the way of dialogue or conversation, if we approach him after completing the quest, Dampened Spirits, we'll be able to have the following exchange with him. Take a listen. I've never seen anyone with skills like yours. I just wanted to let you know that if you need anything, you can talk to me. My father told me he found me as a young boy in the wreckage of a ship that sank off of the coast near Solitude. All he found in my pocket was a tiny smooth stone inscribed with some sort of strange runes. No one does. I've even taken the damn thing to the College of Winterhold. I must have spent every last coin I've made with the guild trying to find out what it means. Perhaps they could be nonsense, inane scribbles done by someone in idle boredom. But if not, if they actually mean something, they might tell me where I'm from, what ship I was on, everything. Actually, the fisherman who found me, the man I call my father, gave it to me. Thought it was fitting, I suppose. I never changed it because it never felt right to do so. I appreciate that. So, Rune was discovered on a shipwreck by some fisherman with nothing but a stone in his pocket with strange symbols carved on it. The fisherman took him in and raised the boy as his own, naming him Rune after the gem. While this is all the thief will reveal to us personally, nearby on a shelf in the cistern is a letter titled No Word Yet apparently written by a private investigator Rune hired to unravel his past. It reads, Quote Rune, 
I've used every resource at my disposal, and I still can't find a trace of your parents. Whoever they are, they've completely erased themselves from history. This is quite a feat, considering the quality of my sources. If I come up with anything else, I'll be certain to contact you. Signed, Athel Newberry. So, as you might imagine, this mystery has spawned quite a bit of speculation within the community. Some players are convinced that this story is attached to some sort of long-lost cut content. Others argue that maybe the language found on Rune Stone was a lost Nordic dialect. We know that the ancient Nords of Skyrim used a still undeciphered Viking-like script that was eventually replaced by Dovazul. Perhaps that's what was engraved on the rock. Nonetheless, whatever this poor thief's true origins may be, only Todd Howard knows, and Todd Howard isn't talking. Next on our list, who is Amon Motier working with? So, during the events of the Dark Brotherhood questline, Amon Motier is the Breton man who offers the guild an astounding 20,000 septums to take down Emperor Titus Mead II. Long story short, the Brotherhood accepts his contract, and we do indeed succeed, though not without complications. However, Amon's exact motivations for calling the hit are deliberately left a mystery by Bethesda, though they also provide some thought-provoking hints. For one, shortly after our first meeting with the man, as a sort of deposit and proof of goodwill, Amon will give the Brotherhood an Amulet of the Elder Council. This is an insanely rare and priceless piece of jewelry, only given to members of the Emperor's royal court. This highly implies that Amon's cause has some powerful supporters. Either someone on the Elder Council itself is working with him, or they somehow managed to take it from a member. Either way, it's proof of his connections. The Motier family actually made an appearance in the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, where we meet a distant ancestor of Amon's named Francois Motier. Francois is not an especially important character in Tez IV, and in fact is defied by his cowardice, but characters in the game remark that the Motier family is an ancient and wealthy clan, going back hundreds if not thousands of years. So by the time of the events of Skyrim, it's likely that they retain some of their connections to Tamriel's high politic. When blatantly asked about his motivations, Amon will say the following. In the year 3E41, e Emperor Pelagius Septim was murdered in the Temple of the One in the Imperial City, cut down by a Dark Brotherhood assassin. His killing ushered in, shall we say, a necessary change in Imperial policy. There are those now who wish for a similar change. I am sorry, but that's all I'm at liberty to say. Necessary change to Imperial policy. This could mean anything from getting a new Emperor who's more aggressive toward the Thalmor, to one who simply favors his weird political faction more than another in the Council. Either way, whether Mr. Moltier is working on behalf of some grand conspiracy to completely change the course of history, or is just a pawn in some minor squabbling between obscure internal factions, only he and his allies know the truth. Coming in at number 3, Phalion is an unusual Redguard mage living in the town of Morthal. Evidently, he was once an esteemed professor at the College of Winterhold, but due to some unexplained falling out with staff, and an odd infatuation with the local swamps, he recently moved out here, where he's been conducting some secretive research. Phalion's presence in the town is extremely unpopular with the locals. They're skeptical of all things magical, and suspect he's practicing some dark forms of witchcraft. Some residents even claim to see him sneak out into the marshes at night. As a matter of fact, 
when we first enter Morthal, we can find a small assembly of citizens outside the town hall, demanding the Jarl kick him out. If we speak with the Jarl, Igrid Ravencrone, she'll even ask us to investigate Falian's presence in the town and report back to her. Beginning the quest, Falian's Secret. When we first attempt to speak with the man for ourselves, he'll be rather short and hostile with us, assuming we're just as closed-minded to his presence as everyone else in the village. But after easing his concerns with the correct dialogue choices, he'll eventually warm up to the player and reveal a bit more about himself, though not much. Apparently, despite his cold welcome by the locals, Thalion decided to move out here because he believes his skills are needed to quote, keep Morthal safe, and that Morthal is a deeply troubled place, and it's his duty to protect it. So that's kinda ominous, but he doesn't elaborate any further. Evidently, he's keeping a lot to himself. If you stand before me to accuse me of sacrificing children or eating the hearts of the dead, you may save your breath! I have done no such thing, nor do I intend to. I simply wish to live my life in peace. The people of Morthal would much rather weave their own horrid tales about my life than simply ask me for the truth. If they choose to fear me in their ignorance, that's their choice, but it will not change what is true. As anyone will tell you, Morthal can be a dangerous place. My talents are useful here. I help maintain order, even if it goes unnoticed. The marsh is treacherous. You would do well to not wander at night. Another interesting fact about this guy is that he has an adopted daughter named Agni. Agni won't directly offer any dialogue with the player, but if we hang around their house, we can sometimes hear radiant conversations between her and Phalion, where she alludes to some very mysterious dreams. Have you been working on your concentration? Yes, sir, I have. Good, good. Concentration is paramount when dealing with magical forces. Why? Because an unfocused mind will almost certainly be obliterated. Destroyed by the forces you attempt to control and yield. Oh. I had a bad dream again last night. Oh? I dreamt that you went away. You made monsters. It was scary. It was like it was real. Hush now. Think no more of it. Should we stick around Phalian's house past 10 p.m., we'll see him suspiciously exit the home and head deep into the marshes, eventually arriving at a strange stone ritual complex, where he'll idle around and occasionally enter a praying animation. What the heck? When confronted about this, the mage will refuse to explain what he's doing, but will beg the player to keep his actions a secret, offering us a generous bribe. From here, we'll have to choose between accepting his offer or revealing his actions to the Jarl, who will order him to stop. Either way, though, nothing more will come of this. As if Phalion wasn't already a mysterious enough character, though, he can also cure vampirism. If we approach him while infected with the disease, he'll offer to treat our condition if we can get him a black soul gem for the necessary ritual and some coin for his trouble. This unlocks some additional dialogue where he elaborates on his expertise and boldly claims to have met Daedra and Dwemer while walking through oblivion. Take a listen. Morthal is a troubled pl Please remain indoors at night. It is dangerous to go outside. I know many things. I have studied things beyond the reach of most humans. 
traveled the oblivion plains, seen things one should not see. I have met Daedra and Dwemer and everything in between, and I know enough to see a vampire where others would see a man. I met several of your kind during my studies of life-extending magics. I even considered becoming a vampire myself. In the end, vampirism would endanger my ward Agni, which would defeat the intended purpose. It is possible. I know of a ritual, but have never performed it. It requires a filled black soul gem. You will need to kill someone. When you have a gem and have filled it, return to me and I will perform the ritual. I will bring life to your dead body, vampire. This series of claims only creates more questions about the Red Guard's past. Funnily enough, once you've retrieved the requested items for the cure, he'll lead the player to the same stone ritual site we found him at earlier, and cast some kind of spell, restoring our true mortality. Overall, our experiences with Phalion are some of the most mysterious in the game, and to this day, over 10 years after its initial release, Phalion remains one of Skyrim's most interesting NPCs. For our fourth spot, what's up with Olava the Feeble? So, Olava the Feeble is a seemingly very ordinary and very insignificant elderly NPC living in Whiterun. At first glance, she seems just like any other shaky old lonely woman. She spends her days meandering about the city and sitting outside her small, rather modest home in the Plain District. However, if we play our cards right during a certain Dark Brotherhood contract, we'll learn that she's anything but typical. You see, during the quest, Breaching Security, we'll be tasked with hunting down and planting false evidence on a certain Penitus Oculatus agent, who's been traveling around Skyrim. While all that's required to complete the quest is to simply do just that, fellow guild member Gabriella will offer us a quote-unquote bonus if we liquidate him in a city in front of a large crowd, so as to inspire fear in the populace. Again, this side objective of carrying out the contract in public is entirely optional. But, if done properly, when we return, Gabriella will say the following. Yes, I know, as does Astrid. You have done well and have earned both a reward and a bonus, as I have mentioned. She awards us with this mysterious token to exchange for some kind of psychic session with Olava. And sure enough, when we visit the elderly woman, the following dialogue will play out where she correctly predicts the future of the Dark Brotherhood questline and directs us to an otherwise unmarked location with some neat loot. Yes, token, you say? Let me see. Oh, goodness me. You're a friend of Gabriella's, then. Well, I guess we both know why you're here. Hmm. Well, yes, yes, I, I surely can. It, it's not something I do lightly, mind you, and it's, it's not as specific as you might want, but yes, I, I will do this for you. Please, relax. Free your mind. Yes, that's it. There's a cave. No, not a cave. A uh, home, a, a place you feel secure. You will find safety there, sanctuary. I see snow, lit by the star of dawn. And you are not alone. There are others, a child of night, a stalker of the sands. Oh, but before you are family, there will be blood. Such blood. Wait. 
There's something else. A potential for adventure and wealth. It is a ruin, ripe for the plunder. Deepwood Redoubt, far to the northwest. Through there is Hag's End, the last resting place of an assassin of old. A dark brother who bequeaths his ancient earthly possessions to you. No, no, that is all. Now, now, please. I find myself very weary all of a sudden. Such an accurate reading, where she correctly predicts the final moments of the Dark Brotherhood questline, and our relocation to a new sanctuary with a young-looking Babette and Nazir, highly implies that Olava possesses a mysterious, supernatural gift. Unfortunately, the woman offers no further dialogue, nor can we inquire for an explanation from our fellow Brotherhood members. So, the trail is rather cold. Although, it's worth pointing out that at a small bandit camp just northwest of the city, called Smuggler's Cove, we can find a letter where the bandits discuss severing ties with a fellow tribe, and seem to reference Olava. It's pretty short, so I'll just read it for you. Quote, Akari, you can take those prices and eat them. We found our own source of skooma now. The real stuff, not that watered-down third-hand trash you've been selling. And don't even think of ratting us out. One word to the guard, and I'll make sure they know what that seer of yours is really up to." End quote. This document implicates our Olava in the skooma trade as well, and she seems to be working with someone named Akari, a very Khajiit name. So maybe she's working with the Khajiiti caravans to supply skooma or something. Either way, between these guys and the Brotherhood, Olava the Feeble has quite the connection to Skyrim's criminal underground. Furthermore, some players have raised the possibility that maybe Olava could also be using Skuma in some capacity to gain her insights. Though, that requires a certain interpretation of the text. No matter, whatever the source of her powers, it's clear that Olava the Feeble is far more than initially meets the eye. Next on Tier 4, it's not exactly a secret that Astrid, the femme fatale leader of the Dark Brotherhood, is quite a dishonest fellow. Aside from literally murdering innocent people to death for money, she also iconically betrays the Dragonborn to the Empire at the climax of the Guild's questline for her own selfish reasons. However, there's reason to suspect that we aren't the only person who Astrid's betrayed. You see, while she's married to the Brotherhood blacksmith, Arnbjorn, who also happens to be a werewolf, there's rather undeniable proof that she's also had a relationship with Delvin Mallory, a high-ranking member of the Thieves' Guild in Riften. There's very little dialogue within the game that confirms this, though during one mission where Astrid sends the player to seek aid from the Thieves' Guild, she does mention Delvin having a, quote, history with the Brotherhood. Take a listen. And there's only one man who can give us what we need. Delvin Mallory. He's a fence, a private operator. Works out of the Ratway in Riften. Give me the letter. Bring Mallory the amulet. Find out everything you can and sell it if he's willing. He'll offer a letter of credit. That's fine. Delvin Mallory and the Dark Brotherhood have... Uh, history. He can be trusted. When we finally meet Delvin as a part of this same quest, he'll immediately ask about Astrid, and tell the player to invite her over for a drink so they can catch up. Oh. Oh, I see. Well now, how is Astrid doing these days, huh? 
tell her to stop by sometime. We can have a drink. Catch up. Ah, but we can discuss that later, eh? What does the Brotherhood need? Though neither character ever explicitly confirms a romance, the Skyrim official game guide, written by Bethesda, elaborates on the dynamic between these two kingpins a bit further, in a small paragraph it has about Delvin. Quote, Delvin grew up in Riften's Honor Hall orphanage. He was taken in by Gallus, but Delvin accidentally killed a man while on a robbery. Gallus arranged to have Delvin stay with the Dark Brotherhood, and he remained in hiding in their sanctuary for a year. While there, Delvin gained a new respect for the shadowy organization. After the death was long forgotten, Delvin Mallory returned to Riften and the embrace of the Thieves' Guild, but never forgot his friends in the Dark Brotherhood. And his lover, Astrid. So, there you have it. Once upon a time, Delvin was put on probation with the Brotherhood and developed a romance with Astrid before eventually returning to the Guild. However, this still doesn't prove that anyone was betrayed or acting unfaithfully. It's not clear whether or not Astrid was already married to, or had even met her husband Arnbjorn yet. Maybe he didn't enter the picture until later on. Well, it may not have been Arnbjorn who Astrid was betraying. After completing the Thieves' Guild quest, Blindsided, the Dragonborn and Carlia call for a meeting with all guild members in the Cistern, where the two of you reveal that Guildmaster Mercer Frey has in fact been a traitor all along. If you approach Delvin during or right after this meeting, he won't enter conversation, but will say this brief line of dialogue. Stabbed in the back. It's like the dark brotherhood all over again. Can't talk long. Gotta keep my eyes open for Mercer. Hold your thoughts until after we untangle this mess. Stabbed in the back. It's like the dark brotherhood all over again. I'm going completely out on a limb here, given our fundamental lack of sources. But maybe Delvin was romantically backstabbed by Astrid. Perhaps while they were a couple, she decided to betray him for her current partner, Arnbjorn. It would make sense. There's nothing else we can think of that could have offended Delvin in such a way. And it would explain how he still seems to have a fondness for Astrid. No matter, perhaps we should let Skyrim's deadliest love triangle keep its own secrets. And finally, speaking of treachery, last on Tier 4, Gorm is the personal bodyguard of Morthal's Jarl Igrid Ravencrone. While he initially looks like any other loyal Nord housecarl, looks can be deceiving. Should you bump into him at the local Moorside Inn, he'll reveal that he's losing confidence in his Jarl, and request that the player deliver a letter to Captain Aldis the commander of the guard in solitude. Gorm will explicitly demand the Dragonborn not read the contents of his note. However, there's nothing stopping us. The letter's contents are simple. They read, quote, Aldous, you know what we've spoken of in the past. It is time. Change is needed. Something must be done. I await your response. Gorm. End quote. When we deliver the note to Aldus, he'll reward us with the promised coin, and say the following. For me? From whom? Well now, that is something. Hand it over, please. Oh no. I hadn't heard from Gorm for a while, so I'd hoped he'd given up his little scheme. The last time we discussed this issue was before this damnable war broke out. Things were different then. Now, what he's asking, it's just impossible. Even if it worked, the questions and accusations it would cause, well, I'll take it under advisement. Thank you. 
It seems blatantly obvious that Gorm is plotting to overthrow his liege. But why? And replace her with who? Aldous seems to have at one point been open to this idea, but with the onset of the Stormcloak Uprising, he's no longer interested. So clearly this plan has been in place for a long time. Why barely move now? Also, isn't Igrid supposed to be somewhat psychic? You think she would have seen this coming? But um Between Morthal's vampire problem, its mysterious mage, and such a disloyal court, it's no wonder why its citizens are on edge right now. Alrighty, so that about does it for the remainder of Tier 4. Now we finally descend into the depths of our final tier, Tier 5. This one serves as a grand compilation of my favorite, most obscure Skyrim mysteries that we've ever covered. Normally, I'd warn you, because many of these topics are a bit on the longer side, requiring more preamble than usual to explain, but looking back on the script, that was also true for the first half of this video. So, without any further ado, you know the drill. Starting off Tier 5, we have what may be my favorite Skyrim mystery ever. What is Jarl Bulgruff hiding from his family? Okay, so at first, such a question sounds preposterous. Like, Jarl Bulgruff is one of the most honorable and honest characters in the game. He's one of the very few Jarls who seems both genuinely intelligent and interested in the well-being of his people. He's like a Skyrim Ned Stark. So the idea that he could be lying about something or have some sort of dark secret sounds absurd. And yet, it's also quite likely. You see, during the quest, The Whispering Door, we learn that one of the Jarl's children, Nelkir, has fallen under the influence of Mafala, Daedric God of Betrayal and Deceit. She has apparently been whispering to Nelkir from behind a locked door in the Dragon's Reach basement, and filling his head with all kinds of horrifying suggestions. When we speak to Nelkir for ourselves, he'll admit to befriending the evil spirit, and tell us this. So, the disgusting pig sent you to bother me. One day, I'll tear his face apart so he can leave me alone. <laughs> My father doesn't know anything about me. But I know about him, and about the war, more than he might think. I know that he still worships Talos, that he hates the Thalmar almost as much as the Stormcloaks do, that he worries about being chased from Whiterun, that he, that I'm, that I don't have the same mother as my brother and sister. That I don't have the same mother as my brother and sister. What? Jarl Bulgruf has three children, Frothar, Dagny, and of course, Nelkir. And there are literally no references in the entire game to the mother of these kids. Like, none at all. No characters talk about her, there are no letters, nothing. We're just kinda left to assume that she's not in the picture. Perhaps she passed away, or had a falling out with her husband. But this little quip from Nelkir alludes to the fact that he came from a different woman than his siblings, and that's supposed to be a secret. So, this leaves us with two questions. One, what happened to Bulgruf's original wife? And two, who is Nelkir's mother? Well, a look in the game files gives us a sort of answer to one of those questions. Believe it or not, in Skyrim's creation kit, Nelkir, unlike his siblings, isn't actually flagged as Bulgruf's son. No. Instead, Nelkir is tagged as Bulgruf's brother. Roll Tide. Now, it's not clear to me whether Bethesda is genuinely implying some sort of Oedipus complex here, or if this was just an accident made by the developers. Because it's just such a random thing. There's no reason to think Bulgruf's mother was even alive by the time Nelkir was born, let alone capable of bearing children. So, 
it seems rather unlikely that the Jarl and Nelkir could be brothers. More likely, some radiant dialogue that can be overheard between Balgruf and his council seem to indicate that Whiterun's ruler has a fondness for sneaking out into the town and drinking late at night. Take a listen. Balgruf, did you slip out again last night for a drink at the Bannet Mare? Heard about that, did you? Yes, I went out for a pint or two. What of it? These secret visits to the tavern will make you an easy target for an enemy assassin. You should have told me first. Damn it, woman, I'm the Jarl of Whiterun. I won't apologize for talking to my people. You can't protect me every moment of the day. That might be so, but it will never stop me from trying. It's quite possible that during one of these spouts at the tavern, Balgruf once got carried away and made a mistake. And, nine months later, this mistake was named Nelkir. Still, though, we're left to ponder the fate of the Jarl's first wife. Did she pass away? Leave him when she found out he was having an affair? Bethesda doesn't give us anything to go off of here, really. It is worth noting that once we complete the Whispering Door quest, we'll find that behind that door is Mafala's Daedric artifact, the Whispering Blade. The Whispering Blade is said to communicate to whoever bears it, and give them dark thoughts of betrayal. How did it end up here, behind this door? Daedric artifacts don't just spawn in randomly, they're transferred from owner to owner. Someone in Whiterun's court must have possessed it at some time. Next to the blade is a unique book called Admonition Against Ebony. It's a little on the long side by the standards of what I normally read, but I think its contents are important, so I'll go through the three paragraphs in their entirety. Quote, To anyone reading this, beware this blade. It is hoped that the only people having access to this room should be the Jarl of Whiterun and his trusted wizard. If anyone else is reading this, please understand the magnitude of your folly. Turn around and never speak of this room or this blade to anyone. It has corrupted and perverted the desires of great men and women, yet its power is without equal. To kill while your victim smiles at you. Only a Daedra most foul could have concocted such a malevolent and twisted device. But it appears that all who wield it end up with the crazed eyes of those wild men who roam the hills chattering with rabbits. It is not to be trifled with. Not even the hottest fires of the Skyforge could melt it. Indeed, the coals themselves seemed to cool when it was placed within. We cannot destroy it, and we would not have it fall into the hands of our enemies. So we keep it, hidden, dark and deep within Dragon's Reach, never to be used. Woe be to any who choose to take it. So clearly, Balgruf's court is very, very much aware of the device, and they've even tried to destroy it. How did they come into contact with it? Could it, perhaps, have fallen into the hands of the Jarl by accident? Maybe he made a horrible mistake with his original wife. Whatever the case, the history between this blade and the royal court is only the Jarl's business. Next in Tier 5, as you may have noticed, every single Dark Elf in Skyrim, and indeed the entire Elder Scrolls franchise, has dark red eyes. This, along with their ashy skin, is said to be the result of a curse placed on their people by a Daedra thousands of years ago. However, there is actually one Dunmer we can meet in the Elder Scrolls V who, for some reason, breaks this rule. Meet Carlia. She's a former high-ranking member of the Thieves' Guild who serves as a major protagonist throughout the faction's questline. Evidently, long ago, she was accused of murdering her former guildmaster to death and forced into exile. During the events of the game, however, we learn that she was actually framed for the crime by Mercer Frey, who wanted to seize power for himself. 
Following this revelation, Carlia essentially becomes our partner, as we try to prove her innocence and bring the real traitor to justice. Something we ultimately succeed in doing. Nonetheless, what we're interested in right now is the fact that Carlia's eyes are actually purple rather than typical Dunmer Red. Why is that? Oddly enough, this is never addressed in the questline, and we can't ask her about this unique feature. It's just passed over. Alas, Bethesda did leave a few hints. You see, there's this famous love affair in Elder Scrolls history, which took place roughly 400 years ago between a Dunmer monarch named Baron Zaya and a Bosmer wizard named Jagar Tharn. Now, this full story would honestly require its own full hour-long video to explain it, but I'll do my best to condense it into just the spark notes. Baron Zaya was the famously promiscuous queen of Morrowind, ruling in the name of the Emperor, and Yagar Tharn was the Emperor's chief battle mage. This whole event is elaborated upon heavily in several books, and the Elder Scrolls Arena's main questline. But long story short, Jagar Tharn was secretly plotting against the realm and devised a plan to take the throne for himself. To do this, he needed a certain staff that was in Queen Baron Zaya's possession. So, he ruffled over to Morrowind, seduced the queen, and after a few nights in her bedchamber, stole the staff and ran off kicking off the events of the first Elder Scrolls game, and earning a name for himself as one of the most cunning and nefarious men in Tamrielic history. Okay, Nate, cool story, but what does this all have to do with Carlia? Well, while no official biographies or court records mention Baron Zaya giving birth to any children as a product of this affair, the multi-volume book, The Nightingales, which explains the history of a powerful faction of nocturnal worshippers in the Thieves' Guild, blatantly claims that through this brief fling, Carlia's mother was born and promptly abandoned by the Queen. Thus, Carlia may be the granddaughter of Queen Baron Zaya and Jagar Tharn, Arena's main antagonist. Her direct lineage from these two characters seems to be the cause behind Carlia's unique eye color. And indeed, Bethesda sort of confirmed this in 2019 with the Elder Scrolls Legends card game, where Baron Zaya's card also depicts her with purple eyes. So, case closed, right? Well, kind of. It's still not obvious how Baron Zaya herself ended up with Lavender Eyes. While she was a queen, there's nothing to indicate anything special about her blood, as she was born to non-royal parents anyway. Furthermore, many sources dispute whether it was actually Jagar Tharn who she had the affair with. As the Nightingales' book author, actually argues it was just a random thief who seduced the queen, and she lied and pretended it was Jagar Tharn for more street cred. So this whole thing is really just one giant mess. My personal theory is that perhaps Carlia and Baron Zaya as well, may descend from a certain bloodline of Dark Elves that was somehow spared from the totality of the Daedric Curse. But there's nothing in the game that gives us evidence of that in either way. Perhaps we'll meet another descendant of this family in the Elder Scrolls 6, or maybe an ancestor in a future ESO DLC. But right now, we can only hope. Mysterious Matriarch refers to the fact that in various Forsworn camps, the player can find hidden letters from Reachmen, which mention a mysterious, feminine character known as the Matriarch. There are several of these notes we can find scattered throughout Skyrim's western provinces. This one example comes from Serpent's Bluff Redoubt. We can find it laying on a table guarded by a Forsworn Briarheart. It reads, 
Quote, The matriarch grows weary of your hesitation. Our people control the entire eastern slope of the Reach, all save Sunguard. Take it, and the invaders will be cut off from all retreat. But we must do it now, while its defenses are still weak. Summon the tribes, do what you must, but if you do not act, she shall find someone who will. You can see how this matriarch figure is clearly referred to in a leadership context. And again, notes like this can be found all around the map, alluding to her in this secret puppet master fashion. Sadly though, despite all the hype, we never seem to actually encounter the matriarch herself, nor is she even mentioned casually in any quests. This is especially odd, given the fact that during the Sidna Mine questline, we meet a character named Madanak, who claims to be the leader of the Forsworn Rebellion himself. And there is no mention of any matriarch figure throughout this questline. This exclusion could imply that the woman's existence is meant to be kept a secret from outsiders. Maybe Madanak is only the matriarch's puppet, or just the figurehead that she uses. Or, perhaps the Forsworn are more divided than they seem, Maybe there are different factions jockeying for superiority over each other. Interestingly, while as mentioned above, we never get an opportunity to definitively encounter this matriarch figure, in one location, there's a certain Hagraven that seems to fit the bill. At Hag's End, or Deepwood Redoubt, a massive Forsworn occupied fortress in southern Hoffingar, after fighting our way through an onslaught of Reachman Barbarians, we enter a temple-like dungeon structure, where we'll have to face off against several Hagravens. One of these bird women in particular will consistently elude us, using some kind of teleportation spell to disappear away every time we get her health low, only to reappear in the structure later on. She often spawns in standing in front of thrones and other royal symbols before we finally get a chance to defeat her once and for all at the end of the dungeon. It's possible that this Hagraven in particular could be the subject of all the correspondence we've reading. She may be the matriarch. This fits in well with what we know about the Forsworn. At several of their camps, Hagravens can be seen in leadership-like positions. Why wouldn't the whole organization be led by one? So maybe, just maybe, at this entirely unquest-affiliated dungeon in the far north, we actually have the ability to take out the leader of the Forsworn in an unceremonial fashion. Or maybe the Matriarch is still out there. Next. Let's talk about the suspicious circumstances surrounding Septimus Cygnus's disappearance. So, Septimus Cygnus is a deranged Nord mage and researcher, who resides in a small glacial outpost on the northern edges of the map. While Septimus may be an absolute nutcase in the present era, he was once a rather esteemed professor at the College of Winterhold. Until, legend has it, one day he tried to read an Elder Scroll, and it drove him mad. Following his untimely psychotic break, the elderly mage went on a hunt for various Dwemer artifacts that he believed could one day perhaps be used to unlock the secrets of the Elder Scrolls. During the quest, discerning the transmundane, he'll request the player's help in cracking open an ancient Dwemer safe so he can loot whatever's inside. Long story short, we eventually succeed in breaking open the vault, and discover that in it is the Ogma Infinium, an ancient text imbued with the magic of Hermaeus Mora, Daedric God of Knowledge. Septimus will at first approach the book with disappointment and confusion, before attempting to read it and... and, well, I'll just let the gameplay do the talking. What is this? It's... it's just a book. I can see. Yeah. 
the world beyond burns in my mind. It's marvelous. With the sudden disappearance of Septimus, the quest will automatically complete, and we ourselves will be able to open and read the Agma Infinium and gain a level up to several skills. Hermaeus Mora will then appear, thank us for our help, and that'll be that. However, this whole interaction begs the question, what the heck happened to Septimus? Well, at first glance, it's easy to assume that Hermaeus Mora just Minecrafted the man when he had outlived his usefulness. He did the thing he needed to do, so Hermaeus Mora just made him go away. However, the problem with that theory is that Daedric gods usually aren't supposed to be able to do that kind of thing. At least, not in the mortal realm. You see, the deities of the Elder Scrolls universe are generally forbidden from direct intervention. Like, they're unable to just snap their fingers and eliminate a mortal, or drop an anvil on somebody or whatever. Instead, they tend to rely on their followers to accomplish those objectives. So, according to Bethesda's own rules, Hermaeus Mora couldn't have just made Septimus disappear. While it's possible this is just an oversight, some fans have suggested that Cygnus zero-summed. It's very difficult to explain what zero-summing is, the whole concept of it is still being hotly debated in the community, but here's my best try. So, the whole Elder Scrolls universe as we know it is allegedly not real. Well, obviously it's not real, but it's like canon lore that the entire franchise and all of its events are actually just a dream by a mysterious, unknown entity. This entity that's dreaming up the whole universe in which we're in is sometimes referred to as the Godhead. And if you want to get a bit meta, the community often jokes that Bethesda Softworks is itself that whole Godhead. But no matter, every now and then, a character within the games actually realizes this fact. Realizes that what they're in is just a dream, a somewhat meaningless exercise in some thing's imagination. Neither the person having this epiphany, nor the fabric of reality itself, can quite process this properly. And as a result, the individual is simply deleted from reality. It's like, sorry, you can't handle the truth, and the truth can't handle you, so you just disappear. That's zero-summing, and it's what some people think happened to Septimus. The way he calls out the world beyond and it burning his mind seems highly notable to me in this context. Still, without any solid confirmation, it's impossible to understand what curious event really took out Septimus Cygnus, for his fate is now between him and Hermaeus Mora. For number 5 on Tier 5, at the climax of the Dark Brotherhood questline, we'll be sent to board the Emperor's personal ship, the Kataraya, and take him out once and for all, fulfilling Amon Motier's contract. After a short battle with the bodyguards, we'll ultimately make our way into Titus Mead's quarters and complete the job. However, did you know that we may not have been the only assassin on this boat? In several rooms within the Kataraya's cabin, oddly placed bodies can be found, belonging to both Penitus Oculatus agents and sailors. In one room in particular, the bodies of two guards can be found lying on beds, being watched over by a sailor. While it's possible this could be a sick bay or some kind of infirmary, the ship is at port, so you would imagine any human remains or sick personnel would have been moved off by now. Furthermore, this isn't the only room where there are bodies. And furthermore again, 
hidden behind a door in this room is a potion of prolonged invisibility. What on earth? If this were an infirmary, you would expect healing potions and rags, not nefarious potions. So, many people believe that the Dark Brotherhood may have had a competitor aboard. At number 6, we head to Dawnstar, where Silas Vesuvius is the Imperial who runs the Museum of the Mythic Dawn. The Mythic Dawn were a once powerful faction of Daedra worshippers, who served Maroon's Dagon during the events of the Elder Scrolls IV, where they functioned as the game's primary antagonists until their defeat. Now, over two centuries later, Silas, whose ancestors were apparently members, has decided to open up a museum in the Mythic Dawn's honor, so that their deeds may not be forgotten. Well, one of the artifacts on display in the museum is a page from the original Mysterium Xarxes, an ancient Daedric text supposedly written by Dagon himself in the Dawn Era. Note that the Mysterium Xarxes is really a fascinating subject in and of itself, as it contains all these bizarre Daedric symbols and illustrations, but that's for another day. What we're interested in for the purposes of this video is that if the Dragonborn breaks open its case and decides to strike the Xarxes page with a sword or just inflicts damage on it in any other way, like a spell or something, it will spontaneously transform into a wooden bucket. This, frankly, impossible alteration is given absolutely no explanation. Silas doesn't elaborate on it, and we'll just pretend it's still the normal Mysterium Xarxes, leaving us and the community entirely dumbfounded. The prevailing theory is that this must have never been the original Mysterium Xarxes in the first place, that Silas or someone else used an illusion spell to disguise an ordinary object, like this bucket, into looking like a page from the book, and when we interact with it, the spell simply falls apart. This makes the most sense to me. The Mythic Dawn Museum is clearly a tourist trap, and them possessing a counterfeit copy of the Xarxes would be infinitely more on brand than them having the original. But still, though, you'd expect more elaboration from the game than Bethesda's writers. It's worth noting that the makers of the unofficial Skyrim patch seem to believe that this whole Mysterium Xarxes thing is actually just a glitch, as the mod removes the text's ability to be transformed if you have it installed. However, I'm not quite sure what their rationale is for such a choice. Seems more like a feature rather than a bug to me. Alright, so I know this is rather sudden and anticlimactic, and I promised this would be the last episode, but I think we're gonna need a part four. I'm looking at this video's timeline and we've already hit an hour, and there's still another 30 to 45 minutes for us to go just to finish off tier five. On top of that, I've been thinking throughout this episode, there's a couple of mysteries that should have been included in earlier tiers that I just frankly forgot about when developing the scripts. So maybe what we'll do is we'll upload the final, for reals this time, part four uh, in a couple of weeks, and that'll include the remainders of tier five and a sort of epilogue where I hit on the few ones that I missed. No promises for sure when that'll be out. I've got a couple other videos in the cooker that I would like to get out first, but definitely before the new year, we will get the final, final Skyrim Mysteries Iceberg and wrap this whole little mini-series up. Um, but yeah, with that, I really hope you guys enjoyed. It's been an absolute blast working on these videos. You might have noticed that this time, this is the first video I've uploaded in, like, years where I didn't just have the Skyrim uh, background theme on loop repeatedly. I got a lot of heat for that in the earlier videos, 
a, a long time ago that used to work when my content was like five to seven minutes long. I could just loop the theme a couple of times and no one would care. But I've, I've realized that when you have hour-long content, people notice that, and it drives them absolutely nuts. So hopefully you've uh, noticed and appreciated the change. Let me know if you have any feedback on that, if there's uh, something you'd like me to do with the tracks, if they were too loud, if you'd like them to be more quiet, whatever it is. But yeah, thanks so much for stopping by, everyone, and uh, I hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everybody.